Nice to see you all this morning. You all weathered the, uh, the happy hour pretty well. <laughs> it was great to chat with, with some of you around there and get a sense of what you're doing. Um, so I know you heard graduated from here. Well, I graduated from here in 1980. But graduated from college in 1970. How many of you were born in 1970? That's what I thought. <laughs> so you're probably wondering why, how I'm even still breathing here. Um, what I'd like to talk to you today about is just a little bit about my experience here and, and, and where I went with it. And I'll tell you, sitting where you're sitting, uh, I was actually, I'd been in the Army eight years when I'd started the, uh, my graduate school here, and I had stayed down for that eight years at the, at the low levels of the Army, down at the, at the unit level. And, and candidly, after eight years, I was really bored with the mundane day-to-day -day grind of what happens at that level. And if you think back what was going on, this is probably uh, the late 70s. There, there wasn't much going on with the, with the Army in those days, not like it is today. And so I started asking myself, there's got to be more to life and more to the Army than this. So I called up my detailer and said, what do you got? And I was going to be a foreign area officer which meant that, that uh, I was eligible for graduate studies uh, to, prepare my, to prepare me uh, to go uh, become a country expert. So he said, how about grad school? And I said, you know, right, right about now that sounds pretty good to me. And I was actually stationed at the Army base that's right down the road here in Colorado Springs. And so I, I came up here, did kind of what you're doing right now on my own, talked to folks, uh, and came back and applied. And I, I was accepted, which even though my GRE scores were pretty good, I, I didn't really apply myself in college, but they, they took me anyway. Um, what I found when I got here was a, a really uh, receptive uh, and, and flexible faculty. Because what I wanted to do is, is to study Northeast Asia uh, so, so I could prepare myself to be a Northeast Asian foreign area officer. And it didn't quite fit in with what was the, the, the specific programs. But I was able uh, to work with my professors and the administration here to craft my own program. Uh, and it was a program that focused on primarily uh, area studies in China, Russia, and Japan. Uh, a sprinkling of international economics, because I was at least at that time wise enough to figure out that economics was going to play a significant role in all those different countries. And then lastly, uh, baseline international security studies. And my advisor was uh, Professor Peter Van Ness, who has actually just returned from a sabbatical uh, teaching in Japan for uh, two years. And so he had some very uh, good recent experience that, that he shared with me. Uh, he was also the primary China expert here. Um, there are th he, he's no longer, no longer here. Uh, there are three of the professors uh, that I and instructed me here that are still here. In fact, one of them has the Cyber Cafe named after him. And it's, it's striking to me to look back after 32 years, and, and my memories of, of, of what they left me with are still as, as vivid as they were that day here. Uh, Professor Ar Arthur Gilbert taught a couple of classes. One was called How Wars Start, the other was called How Wars End. Now for a, a military person, those are pretty significant topics. But never, never in my wildest dreams did I think that I would be sitting in the White House Situation Room watching the country to make the decision to go to war in Kosovo and then again in Iraq. And, and the grounding I got through the studies here uh, prepared me to deal with the, the huge questions of the United States of America going to war. And then since you, if you took the first class on how they start, you got to figure out how they end. So the, this, I went through the second class and I wound up at the end of, a, end of the Kosovo War on a team with the Deputy Secretary of State, Stroke Talbot, negotiating the end of the Kosovo War uh, with the Russians and with the President of Finland. And the deal was, the Russians were, the, were Milosevic's voice. The president of Finland was the 
even-handed voice to balance out the two sides. And once we and the Russians reached agreement, then the President Adasari and Viktor Chernomyrdin were, were going to fly to Belgrade, which they did, and tell Milosevic, there you go, the war's over, get on with it. Um, but again, well-grounded because of my studies here. Uh, one of my other professors was, was Professor Jonathan Edelman, and he's still here. And he, he taught us, taught me Russian studies. And one of my classmates, who's going to be here Monday, is the former Secretary of State, uh, Condoleezza Rice. And we used to talk about our time sitting in John, Jonathan Edelman's class here, sitting in the Situation Room, waiting for the President to, to come in. Um, he, he helped me understand uh, the mindset of the Soviet Union at that time. And within six months after I left here, I was sitting on the Suez Canal with myself and three Russian officers. Now this is 1980, and, and things weren't too keen between the Soviet Union and the United States in 1980. And there were, so, there were some real tensions there. In fact, we were on an observation post on the Suez Canal, uh, and we took turns rotating the cooking duties. The tensions were so great between us at, at that time that the first time I cooked, they wouldn't take a bite of their food until I took a bite of mine. So that's, that, that's the level of tension. But it prepared me to deal with that. It also prepared to me later at the end of the Kosovo War, after we had agreed the war was going to end, uh, I was on the, negotiate, the military negotiating team that negotiated the Russian presence uh, in the Kosovo mission. And let me tell you, those guys are really tough to negotiate with. But again, I, I, I had a good grounding here and had some idea of what to expect because of my training here. Um, the third professor that's still here is Karen Festi, and she and Catherine Kelleher taught international security studies uh, to, to help me understand particularly uh, the framework uh, that the U.S. government uses for national security uh, decisions. Um, I found myself later in my career at the heart of that, and not only at the heart of that in the United States, but in Iraq, helping three different prime ministers and three different sets of security ministers establish a security infrastructure and architecture for Iraq. And sitting in classes with Karen Festi and Catherine Kelleher, the idea that I'd be doing something of that scope never, never even crossed my mind. I guess the bottom line is uh, the experience here uh, has great potential to assist you in whatever you decide to do. Um, the other thing I got out of here, which was particularly important for me as a military officer, is the ability to interact with a, a diverse group of people and exchange a wide range of views. The military is a, is a fairly closed society, especially at the lowest levels. So I was coming out of a very closed society and Coming in here between the professors and my fellow students, I was exposed to a, a wide range of view. Some very, very far to the left of where I was. And one of the most important things I took out of here that benefited me later in my career was the, the ability to express myself and express my views to people who had entirely different views than I did. And one of the things at the, at the highest levels of the government that military leaders need to do is to be able to explain very complex military issues to civilian leaders who don't have the background and the depth. And my ability to do that started here, interacting with my professors and with my, my fellow students. The last thing I'd tell you about my experience here, which restarted again on Monday, because I felt uh, and I feel very strongly that, you know, once you've served the government for, in my case, 41 years, uh, one of the things you needed to do when you're finished is to give back a little bit and, and to invest in the future. And, and you all are the future. And so I've always thought I'd enjoy teaching, but I just retired on the 1st of June and I wasn't quite sure if I was ready to sign up for a semester just yet. And so the dean, who I've known since he was the ambassador in Macedonia, and I was traipsing around the Balkans with the uh, State Department ambassador, 
offered me the opportunity to come out and, and, and teach for two weeks. And so Katie talked about the course that, that I'm teaching, and uh, I must say, it's a heck of a lot harder. Teaching is a heck of a lot harder than I thought it was. It's an, <laughs> it's an awful lot of work to prepare to ensure you shape the correct insights to, for the students. And then I've been going around to different classes uh, and different professors uh, talking on, on a range of different subjects. Um, and I feel that, for, for me, it's, it's been very beneficial, and, and I look forward to being able to, to continue that down the road. But I think what you also see here is, is there's a committed alumni. And as I said, Secretary Rice will be here uh, on Monday. Uh, and, and the dean, because of his experience, is, be, is able to pull practitioners uh, from Washington. I think the uh, Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Intelligence and, and Research is coming in on uh, next week as well. So you, you, you're, you don't get totally disconnected from what's going on in DC, but it's a much more pleasant environment. <laughs> um, so with that, um, I wish you good luck in, in whatever your choice is. Study hard. Uh, you never know where it's going to take you. And uh, you, Henry Kissinger used to say that when you are in government, you, you, you trade on your intellectual capital. Believe me, when you're at the highest levels of the government, or in government at all, you're cranking on the day-to-day -day stuff. And you're not building intellectual capital when you're here. That's the opportunity to build it. So good luck to you all, and I'd be happy to take some questions about anything you all want to talk about. Yeah, great question. There's, um, you know, and this goes back to the class I'm, I'm teaching on civil military relations, but uh, since our Constitution was written by the, the framers, um, this country has had a, an aversion to a large standing army. And our history has been, after every war, we have drawn down significantly. Yesterday we, we talked about the Korean War. And, there, and five years at, after the end of World War II, the Army had gone from 8 million to just over 600,000. And the ramp was so fast, the readiness of the Army at the beginning of the Korean War was terrible. So in five years, we had taken an army that had conquered uh, Germany and Japan and, and made it incapable of fighting. So, so that's the risk that, that we're taking here. Um, that's, that, uh, the other problem we have right now is the war's not over. So, so we're, for the first time, faced with a situation where we're drawing down our military while we're still fighting. Now, so we have to be very careful about how we do it. For me, as the Chief of Staff of the Army, we saw this coming uh, probably after my first year in the job. Because if you go back and look at defense spending since World War II, the peaks and valleys are almost symmetrical. And so I had, I had my programmers go back and extrapolate it, and they said, yep, we're at the top of a peak. And, and our budget is going to continue to go down. Frankly, they said it could go as low as $100 billion. Now, now think about that, as low as $100 <laughs> billion. Um, on September 11th, the Army budget was $78 billion, so a little over a decade ago. When I got to the job, the Army budget was $254 billion. That includes the cost of the war. And it stayed above $200 billion the whole time I was there. Now, the, the budget was going to come out anyway because we don't have the expenses of, in Iraq anymore. So that's a significant drop in the budget. The, the problem for us and, and for all the services and really for business is the cost of people continue to rise. And so what I feared was that we would do what we have done in the past in the Army. We would try to hold the strength of the Army too high, put 40 to 50 percent of our money into personnel, and then not have enough money left because of declining budgets to make sure that it was trained, properly equipped, properly educated, and that the families were properly taken care of. And what happens with that is you begin a hollowing process. And at the end of five to 10 years, now you have a hollow force. 
And I came into a hollow force in, at the, uh, in the early 70s. And I was resolved that I wasn't going out to a hollow force. So the bottom line is, we have to reduce the strength of the Army somewhat if we're going to maintain a balanced and not a hollow force while we continue to prosecute this war. And so the question is not should we reduce the size of the Army, the question is how should we do it? And if you do it on a, a gradual ramp, which, which the plan is now, you can do it without unhinging, unhinging the force. You know, Russia's going to act in, in their own interest. And, and that's, I mean, you can write, you can write this down. <laughs> I've, I've learned, you know, there's a couple of truths that you learn over time. States particularly act in their own interests. They don't necessarily do what the United States of America wants them to do. Uh, when I was in Iraq, we granted Iraq sovereignty. So now I'm dealing with three prime ministers of a country that, that think it's a sovereign country. And I'm trying to get them to move on a pace that Washington wants them to move on, the ambassador that. And, and that wasn't, uh, didn't exactly work out the way Washington planned. But anyway, countries, countries will act in their own interest. Uh, and, and I assume by the fact that the Russians continue to, to, to veto action on this, um, they, they've decided that it's in their interest not to have a, a, any type of international intervention in, in Syria. Um, Syria is a, it's a pretty volatile situation, and I worry about it in, more in a regional context. Um, because if you look at what ha the, the, the situation in Syria, you have a a Shia-like sect, minority government, that's been governing a largely Sunni country with a very heavy hand for years. In Iraq, you have just the opposite, except the Shia, it's a majority Shia government, and they're governing a minority Sunni group. And the Sunni population of Iraq is, is, is especially, in the, it's in the north and in the west, along the Syrian border. And since, since I got to Iraq, and probably before that, President Assad has, had been turning a blind eye to an al-Qaeda facilitation network that recruited ex, uh, extremists uh, from all across the Middle East, brought them into Damascus, and moved them into Iraq as suicide bombers uh, through a, a very elaborate facilitation network. And, and so, in all that turmoil that's going on in Syria right in Syria right now, there's a, a fairly well established Al Qaeda facilitation network. So you now have Sunni extremists that could be attached to uh, Sunni insurgents. They've been fighting us for ten years in in, in Iraq, and and that's that, that could be a lot of a lot of turmoil there. And uh, so. I mean, the Russians are going to act in their own interests. I don't know particularly why they, that they don't want to go forward, but I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that international intervention in Syria uh, right now is, would serve anybody, anybody well, particularly the United States. We, we would probably bring more turmoil to it than, uh, than we'd help. Um, the short answer is I, I don't know. You know, they just had the Iraq just hosted the Arab summit. Unfortunately, 12 of, the, 12 of the 22 countries didn't show, and most of them were the Gulf states that you're talking about, including Saudi Arabia. Um, I went to Saudi Arabia on a, when I was the chief of staff of the Army, I think in uh, probably January, January of 2010, met with the leadership, and, and I was surprised. I mean, the Minister of Defense, who's, who's since died, um, talked to me about about Prime Minister Maliki and how he was an Iranian puppet. And I said, hey, look, I, I've been gone for a little bit, but when I was there, uh, Prime Minister Maliki was not an Iranian puppet. In fact, he, he worked very hard to uh, push back on, on Iranian influence. I guess what, I'm sorry, uh, my uh, thought I'm, I'm not getting to the point here, sorry. Well, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> if the Gulf states reject Iraq, it doesn't really leave them that much of an alternative but to That's, I mean, that, that is absolutely a concern, and I was, I was coming to that. <laughs> but, but, but by and large, um, 
you know, I tried to start something with the, with the Saudis to get them going. Now, it wasn't just me. It, it, all of the ambassadors that I worked with, I'm sure Chris Hill did the same thing, went to Saudi Arabia and, and tried to get them to open their arms and, and accept Iraq. Uh, they want Iraq as a buffer against Iran. And so it's in their interest to figure out how to allay their concerns about Iran partnering with Iraq. And actually, if they, if they help the Iraqis, I think they'll find out that they have a buffer. Because my experience was Iraqi Shia are Iraqis first and Shia second. Sorry it took so long. Go ahead. The, the first point I'd make on, on the new security strategy that came out was the good news is the civilian leaders of the United States have presented the military with a strategy. That, that, that is really good news. And it's, you know, it's their it's the responsibility of the, the strategic leadership to do that, and they've done it. So that's a good thing. Now, in, anything as big as a defense strategy for the United States, a global defense strategy, it, you're, you're not going to please everybody. Uh, personally, I believe that uh, the, the, quote, shift toward Asia is, is something that we have been, been trying to do since, since the turn of the century. You know, you remember back with the, at the turn of the century, this is the century of Asia. And, and I, I personally agree with that. Uh, our attention has been focused elsewhere for a while. Uh, so I think the shift is right, but unfortunately, we're going to be involved in the Middle East for a while longer. That's my view. I mean, what's going on in the Arab, with the Arab Spring and in Syria, uh, these things aren't going to get, these countries aren't going to resolve what's going on, the internal turmoil, I think, for another five to ten years. That, that's, it just takes that long to make these transitions. So we're going to, it's not, okay, buddy, forget about the Middle East, let's look over here now. Uh, you're going to see a gradual shift. The other thing is the defense strategy is, is designed to dr drive long-range planning. You know, because you know, the 2013 budget is, is already on the hill. 2014 budget is, is already pretty well developed. And so we, we, we're not going to start seeing changes driven by the strategy probably for another couple of years, which is, which is about right. So it's not an abrupt, abrupt shift, but probably the right, in my mind, probably the right thing to do. Oh, one last thing. What I worry about, what I worry about is that particularly the Air Force and the Navy will use that shift to think about it as a military shift and target China as an enemy and, 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 and wind up driving the Chinese to something that, that they probably wouldn't wind up being. And, and that's something we have to watch very carefully because I personally believe uh, you know, China is, a, is an economic competitor, uh, but boy, the, the internal challenges that, that they face are huge. And, and I don't see any, a little bit of South China Sea, there's a lot of friction down there, but I don't necessarily see expansionist uh, goals coming out of the Chinese. So we, that's, that's a relationship that we need to, to cultivate and, and work very smartly. That's, that's a good question. In fact, that's what we're working our way toward. Uh, we, we, we did, we've done, uh, we started off with the Constitution, did World War II, uh, Korea yesterday, Vietnam uh, Monday, Iraq and Afghanistan on uh, Wednesday and, and, for, and Thursday. Um, if you look at the decision the President just made uh, to surge in Afghanistan in 2009, um, the president was concerned that the some in the military w were trying to box him in and end run him because some particularly retired military leaders have been out there advocating for policy and so I think we, we've had some military leaders uh, and retired military leaders who have overstepped their bounds and and as a result um, caused some in, in the White House, particularly the staff, not necessarily the president directly, to, to question whether the military is really playing by the civil military bargain. And that's something that we as military need to address. Uh, the, the paper that the class has to write is recommendations for the next president on civil military relations. 
So I'm very interested to see what the students take out of this. And uh, so we have some work to do on that. But actually, it, when I, as I look back and you look at what's happened in, in some of these other conflicts, um, yes, there's been friction and tension. And, and believe me, you know, it, it drives me crazy when, the, when you see a big headline that says, there's dissension within the administration over this policy. If there's not dissension, you're going to have a lousy policy. You, you have to encourage dissent to sharpen your thinking on really, really complex issues. And what's happened, what happens is at the highest levels of the government, n nobody wants to be the odd man out, and it just keeps working itself to consensus. And consensus can be good because everybody's behind the policy, but it also can be bad because you get the least common denominator solution which probably isn't the best one. So anyway, yeah, there's friction. Um, we we got some work to do on the military side, uh, but by and large, it served us pretty well through a decade of war. I must admit, I'm a little dated on, on in-depth uh, Russian thinking. Um, my instincts are that if they could gradually build back their empire and, and bring some of those peripheral states back in more closely under their uh, control, their, their influence. Uh, I think they'd probably like to do that. Uh, I think Georgia, I don't think that's necessarily a good example of what they might do. I think they're, the way they'll try to do it is more political than, than military. My personal view about the Georgia situation for a few years ago is they, Georgia significantly miscalculated and paid the price. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's it. I think they've, uh, their military spending, uh, they're starting to modernize, but they've, but, but you talk, talk about a huge drawdown, and, and, and a drawdown that really hollowed, hollowed out the military. The, the Soviet drawdown, I mean, I, I was reading someplace a couple years ago, you know, they were down to like 36 brigades. And at the height of the Cold War, they had that many armies. And so they've, they've had a significant shift. And they're trying to professionalize the force as well, which means it has to be smaller. I mean, the, the force out there is the best force that we have ever fielded. It's combat season, experience, usually capable. But it's a, it's a force that has, is stretched and still s suffering from the lingering effects of a decade of war. War is the most challenging of any human endeavor. And it affects people. And it affects people differently. And, you know, I, I can't help. I don't know. I'm, I'm newspaper deep on all this stuff now because when you retire, they drop you like a hot potato. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can't help but think that the fact that this was his fourth deployment and the stresses and strains that he'd seen as a result of those deployments and the trauma that he has, had experienced uh, in, in terms of losing soldiers uh, in those experiences, it, it, it had to play a role in what happened. We'll never, you know, we won't we'll never know how, what went on in his mind and snapped. The question I think is in people's mind is, is this representative of, of, of the military at large? And, and I'd say no. Um, when I got back from Iraq, uh, we started that first summer uh, with a major effort to reduce the stigma in the Army of getting behavioral health support. When we started, 90% of the people in the Army would not get assistance if they thought they were having a behavioral health problem. 90%. And all our studies show that as soon as you identify you have a problem, the faster you get treatment, the faster you recover, because it's recoverable. So I mean, we, we worked this for the whole time I was the chief. We brought it down to the point where only, when I left, only half still wouldn't get seek assistance. Now that's, that's a big change, but it's still 500,000 people. So we, all, we also began a, a program called Comprehensive Soldier Fitness, where we began training soldiers to build the resilience they need to deal with the challenges they were going to face. And you can build 
and strengthen the resilience of people. What, I've, what we found in, in, in the studies that led up to that, that a lot of people think that everybody that comes back from combat has post-traumatic stress. Everybody is stressed, believe me, there's no doubt about it. But the vast majority, upwards to 90%, come back, the go, people that go to combat have a growth experience. Why? Because they have been challenged by something very, very difficult and they have persevered and they have succeeded. So they actually come back stronger. And, and so the force, while stretched, uh, in my view, is much stronger mentally than it was a, a decade ago. The problem is it, it's very individual. And, and so, you know, even if 90% have a growth experience, you still have 10% of a million that could have, have challenges. And, and that's, the pro, that's, that's the challenge that we're all working very hard on. But I, I don't, you know, I don't think there is any greater risk of, you know, another soldier doing that anytime soon than there is somebody here in Denver walking in and doing it here. Short answer, I don't know how it's going to come out. It, it, it really it, it, it is an answer that will be controlled by the Afghans themselves. The strategy that we're executing right now is that we are trying to, to build the Afghan security forces to the point where, where they can maintain domestic order and keep the terrorists from establishing a safe haven in Afghanistan. Now, as hard as that is, that, that's a pretty minimalist objective. No, we're, we're not trying to build Switzerland. Although you know, there has to be a development component to this, uh, to the point where people can get jobs and they and they rather work at a job than get paid by the Taliban. Um, the, the second thing is that every successful counterinsurgency type war has ended with a reconciliation. Has ended when the government has said, "Okay, it's all it's all forgiven, Taliban, you can come in." And you know, they say may draw some line, but they'll basically try to bring in as many of the Taliban in, into, back into the fold as they can. Um, I don't know if Karzai can do that. Uh, the other thing about, about successful reconciliations is they have to begin when the insurgents have realized that they no longer have effective military options. And I don't think we're quite there yet. But, but we could move there over the next couple of years. But by and large, it's, it, it's up to the Afghans to do. We can, we can only do so much. You know, people ask me the same question about Iraq. You know, should we have, have left? Or should we have left troops there? We had done everything we could for the Iraqis. And the longer we stayed there, the longer the leadership uh, continued to blame us for the decisions that were within their own control to make. And the idea that leaving 3,000 3, or 5,000 more soldiers there would have made a difference, it wouldn't have. And they're on their own. Uh, they have a very, what a rich country Iraq is. Oil, water, fertile ground, educated population. They know that. They just have to get past these, the suppressed frictions of 35 years under Saddam Hussein and move forward. But they're the ones that have to do that. There's nothing else we can do for them. Same, same is gonna happen in Afghanistan. What's the old Yogi Berra? Predictions are hard, especially when you're talking about the future. Uh, I, I'll give you my, what I think. Um, Iran, a nuclear um, Iran, particularly with the ability to deliver a nuclear weapon uh, to, on, on Israel, is, a, is an existential threat to Israel. They recognize that, everybody recognizes that. Um, in my dealings with senior Israelis, and, and you read it in the paper every day, w when they get to the point that they think that Iran is, is approaching the point where they, they will be able to do that, they will act. And frankly, the $64,000 question in Washington right now is, will that happen before the no our November elections? Um, the second thing I tell you about that is there was an article in the Washington Post maybe, I don't know, two, two three weeks ago. And it was a pretty good article. 
And, and what it suggested was that because of what the Iranians have done to, to harden the, the facilities that they're making the, the uranium and the systems in, um, the Israelis really don't have the capability to affect that significantly in terms of bunker, uh, bunker penetrating weapons uh, in, and in terms of the ability to generate sufficient sorties. You know, if, if you can't penetrate the bunker, then you keep that going back and banging it. Well, they don't have the capability to generate the sorties. So I think the Israelis you know, obviously fairly adept at, at using force. You know, I think they'll be making calculations about is the, is the risk worth and uh, a failed attempt or an attempt that does little damage. You know, we've got to unleash all of these tensions that, that as a result of a, fail, of a strike that doesn't really do much. So I think that's a question that, that they'll work. The other thing I've been rethinking is what will the backlash be if, if, if the Iran is kept from, from getting a nuclear capability by force? And, you know, I used to think it would be another, I mean, Iran's the world's largest sponsor, state sponsor of terror. And they have operatives all over the world. And so, you know, the expectation is they, they would attack our, our allies' interests all over the world. The, the, quote, retaliation after the Iranian scientist was killed, if you think about it, there were about th attacks in three different cities and nobody was killed. It doesn't speak to a, high, a very high level of Iranian terror capability now. You know, knock on wood. So I, I, I'm not so sure that, 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 you know, there'll be a worldwide spate of, of, of terror attacks after this is over. I, but anyway, that, that question is being hotly debated as we speak. It's like all policy issues in Washington. Uh, there are no easy answers. There are no good answers. If there was a good answer, we would have done it already. And so that's what, that's what you deal with when you get, you sit around that table in the situation room. All these hugely intractable problems that have no good answers and, and, and no good solutions. And so you get very good at, at defining and developing least bad options. But least bad, <laughs> least bad options executed energetically and effectively have a way of working out. When I was a brigadier, I had the Europe desk in, in, the, in the Pentagon for strategy and policy. And I stood there at the 50th anniversary NATO summit and watched the presidents of Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Poland stand up there and talk about what democracy meant. I mean, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And then we got to watch the other 16, or the other 13 presidents come up and say basically the same thing, and there still wasn't a dry eye in the house. But anyway, over time, though, while I was in Iraq and I watched the, the amount of effort that it took to get this NATO training mission in place, that was a very small mission, I kind of, I got a little disenchanted with NATO. And, and I believe that after years of NATO um, being a political alliance with a very strong military component, that it has been moving over the past decade to a more and more political alliance. Now, the only saving grace is we're actually operating together every day in Afghanistan. And so there's a NATO mission there. And, and so, you know, NATO is also fairly seasoned in, in, in employing force and making the policy decisions that go along with that. Um, that said, I don't see risk in us moving our forces out of Europe. I mean, they've only been there since the end of World War II, and, and there is time to change. Um, so I've been, I have been uh, in favor of moving our forces out of there, leaving, I think we leaving two brigades for the Army there uh, and, and some, you know, some uh, supporting forces so that, that we can still interact with the Europeans. Um, but I think that's about it. I don't think we need much more than that. Um, my, my uh, generals over there, the thing they always came back to me is, it's the relationships you build in peace that allows you to work together in war. And, and that's true. Um, but I, I just, I, I think it, it, it's beyond time for us to, to, to move, a, we're not moving away from Europe, but we're reducing our presence there in Europe. And I don't think there's much risk in that.
Well, it wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't an Al Qaeda rationale. It was. A, it was a weapons of mass destruction rationale. And I sat there. I read the intelligence. I mean, I read it all. And I and I believed that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And and I'll tell you, I still believe they got them buried someplace out in the desert. I just haven't haven't worked with them. Uh, and I and I knew they had them. The thing that 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 kept getting me is the UN went in and inventoried all of their chemical, uh, biological weapons. And then the Iraqis had documents where they had uh, destroyed a portion of them. Where would the rest? There, there was no, nobody had ever fig could, could come back and say where the rest of them were. So I figured, I figured they had them out there. Um, it was an intelligence failure, if you will. But look, intelligence is based on judgments made on analysis. There's no facts in, in intelligence. It, it's based on people's best judgments. And the best judgments of some of the smartest, most dedicated, best educated, hardest working people in the country was that this guy had weapons of mass destruction. and that and so soon after uh, September 11th, that could be a problem for us. The Al Qaeda, yes, yeah, there was some light Al Qaeda ties, but not, that that was not the principal driving driving force behind the decision. Um, if I had any question about it, it was the timing. Why then, when we were just kind of getting our legs under us in Afghanistan? In Afghanistan, and. and but we had those discussions, and the political leadership said, "We need to do this, and we need to do this now." I, you know, there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there that says this was Bush two trying to finish up what Bush one started. I, I just that's that's just that's press baloney. I don't think that's that's the fact. The president was trying to act in a way that he thought would best protect our interests after September 11th. I was the, the director of strategy and policy uh, within a month after September 11th, and, and one of my responsibilities was to, to develop a, a global plan for executing the war on terror. And one of the fundamental issues we wrestle with is, in war you win with offensive action. So we, were we just going to sit here in the United States and duck and, and try to protect ourselves from terrorists coming in or flying planes in or, or doing whatever? Or, or were we going to do something to, to reach out and influence the action? Now, whether reaching out in Iraq was was the right thing, I, you know, I think I think the jury's still out on that. But I will tell you, and, and I can't demonstrate this, but, but having a democratic, moderate government um, right smack in the center of the Middle East, uh, I believe has started to influence what's happening in, in other parts of the Middle East. And I believe it was a catalyst for some of the Arab Spring things that you're seeing right now. I can't demonstrate that and it's going to take years, years to play out. But the war on terror won't be won by us. It'll be, it's a battle between moderate and extremist Islam and, and we can only assist the moderates in achieving their success. And it's, gonna, it's a decade long ideological struggle. That's, that's one of those really hard ones. And you know, as, we, as we've thought about it, um, we're going to get blamed anyway. You know, no matter what happens, they're going to believe that we had a role in it. So we, you know, so we, we will be just as guilty in the eyes of the Iranians and probably most of the Muslim world uh, of that attack. The question will be, what, what will be the reaction against us? And, and I don't know the answer to that. But that is, <laughs> that, that's part of this intractable issue that, uh, that gets kicked around all the time. I, I, don't, I don't know. Boy, that's a terrible way to finish, isn't it? <laughs> but I would tell you, one of the, as, as you grow as, a, as an individual and as a leader, one one of the things that is a, is a big step is a big hurdle to get over is when you realize 
no matter how experienced you are, no matter how smart you are, you're never going to know everything you need to know. And you have to be able to operate and make decisions in uncertainty. And it took me, I think, probably till I was about almost late 30s, early 40s before I could accept that. Now I, I get by it pretty easily. <laughs> anyway, great to spend some time with you. Good luck and uh, sunshine, mountains in the, in the background. Thank you. <laughs>